Welcome, everyone. We'll get started in just a moment. Okay, Chandra, when you're ready, just stop sharing your screen and I'll begin the webinar. Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to the LaserNet US uh, proposal writing workshop. We are glad you are here today. I'm Scott Fuster. I'm a, an assistant professor of computer science at California State University Channel Islands. And I'm also a member of the LaserNet US user committee, which is called iUse. Um, I'd like to take a moment before we get started to recognize um, all the people who have organized and contributed and will participate in today's event. Um, so I'd like to say a special thank you to the people who have been organizing it. Um, Jennifer Ellie, a member of the uh, IU's committee. Um, Chandra Curry, who is the coordinator for LazerNet US, has been a great support to us as we put this together for IU's. Um, and then Ariana Gleason. Francisca Treffert, Sophia Malko, Dean Rusby, Sven Steinke, and Sassi Pelinyapin have been uh, very gracious to volunteer to serve as the Q&A panel later in today's session. Um, so this event um, is organized, but sorry, one sec. This event is organized by the um, IU's committee. Um, and this is the LaserNet US User Committee. Um, we're a team of members who are really dedicated to helping you succeed within LaserNet US. So the purpose of today's talk um, and event is to give you a better familiarity with um, how to write proposals for LaserNet US and also to welcome in members of the community who may be new and actually not even know what LaserNet US is. So here's what we're going to be going through today. So first, we're going to start with the talk about what is LaserNet US. This is a very gentle welcome, especially for people who are not as familiar with LaserNet US. And we want to show you how LaserNet US can help you do your research. Then we're going to hear about how to write a successful proposal for LaserNet US. Next, I'll be talking about some resources that we've put together for you, especially um, something new this year, which is a weekly office hours to help you write if you're stuck or don't know where to start. We'll have a Q&A by the entire panel that I just mentioned of past PIs who have successfully written LaserNet US proposals, and then we'll wrap it up. So now that I've told you about the purpose of today's event and our agenda, we're going to learn a bit about who you are here at the event. So we put together a little survey and then we'll transition into um, Dr. Chandra Curry's talk about what is LaserNet US.
Hey, Scott, this is Ariana. Um, I'm not seeing Chandra's talk. Is she having technical difficulty? I can hop in and present in a pinch. No, thank you, Ariana. So we were just taking a minute to make sure that everyone had a chance to complete the survey. So now oh, that you- Oh, sorry. Oh, that's okay. Thank you for completing the survey. Um, this is very helpful for us to understand who's here. And now I'd like to introduce Dr. Chandra Curry. Dr. Chandra Curry is the LaserNet US coordinator um, and is also a, a research scientist um, at Slack. So she's gonna be telling us about LaserNet US. Thank you, Chandra. Okay, so you should be able to see my slides now. And let me start my video. All right, so thank you, Scott, for the introduction. Um, and today my goal is to give you a brief introduction to, um, to what LaserNet US what is and how you get access to our facilities through this proposal application process that we'll be going through in quite a bit of detail here today. So just let me organize my screen here. All right, so why, who am I? That's where I wanna get started with. So I have um, quite extensive experience um, with high power laser experiments, um, which I got during my PhD. So I take this experience that I have from doing over 30 high power laser experiments around at facilities around the world and bring that perspective to LaserNet US and how we can bring together um, our community and grow it within North America. Um, so my PhD was with the High Energy Density Science Division at SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory um, and dually affiliated with the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department at the University of Alberta. Um, my research itself, uh, just to give you kind of a little bit of context. Um, so I did inertial confinement fusion research um, at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory during my bachelor's degree. Um, and then during my PhD, I focused more um, extensively on high intensity laser plasma interaction, specifically laser driven ion acceleration, um, but also the development of higher precision rate target systems that we can use to transition to the new paradigm of um, high power laser experiments. So I've been the LaserNet US coordinator now for about a year. Um, so I was appointed by the um, DOE FES in November, 2021. Um, and so this is my, I'm going into our second year um, and hoping that um, we can really work to expand the user community. Um, and my dual position with MECU, um, that position is really trying to build connections, grow the community and make eventual connections with that MECU project. All right, so I'm just going to give us a little bit of an introduction here um, before we get started, um, just for those people that are very new or have maybe not had familiarity with um, with user call for proposals or access through this this means. Um, so what is a, what is a proposal itself? Um, and so what this is, is it's a formal application that is submitted for um, for consideration to do an experiment at one of the LaserNet US facilities or at a user facility. Um, so this document has three main objectives. The first one is to describe what you plan on researching. Then you, your goal is to convince the proposal review panel why it's worth researching. And lastly, how you're planning on doing it. So your proposal goes through, a, for, through two reviews. Um, first one is for a scientific, scientific merit and broader impacts evaluation by a proposal review panel. So this is a panel of about 20 people that are going to look at your proposal and evaluate on those means. And then the proposals that are shortlisted are going to then be sent to the LaserNet US facilities. So the one that you designate um, for a technical feasibility review. And so this two-step process um, occurs between the, the submission deadline, which you can see here, uh, December 19th, 2022 is when we're currently accepting proposals until. Then it goes through that two-step evaluation procedure by um, our two, our two um, parts of LaserNet US. And then we're expecting the final list of award experiments to be announced in spring 2023. So somewhere like mid-March mid to early April. So what does this look like? All right, so we're here. So the call for proposals was announced uh, this week. Um, and now that means that our submission system is going to be open up until um, December 19th, so right before the Christmas break. Um, then your proposal is handed into the hands of the proposal review panel and will award the experiments in April, uh, approximately April 2023. And so this gets us all set up for cycle five. And so this is um, the way that we um, group our, our experiments into an annual cycle. And so our annual, our next annual cycle is going to run from about September 2023 to July 2024. 
So if you're awarded an experiment, you are then put in contact with the point of contact at the Laser Night US facility. And then based on what your experiment needs, the current availability and feasibility of that facility, as well as kind of your personnel um, availability, then it go, gets scheduled somewhere in this time window. And that is actually ended up, um, that scheduling is done really um, in coordination with the facility itself, rather than US uh, LaserNet US as an entity. So LaserNet US um, has its open call, as I mentioned, that was announced this week. Um, and all of our proposals are accepted through a web-based proposal application system. Um, so you can visit this website here, lasernetus.org slash proposal, where you can access our full guidelines document here, which gives um, notes on things like safety, um, resubmission of proposals, um, big, large scientific campaigns, kind of all the details and, um, and rules and guidelines that we follow for um, LaserNet US. And then more recently, which Ariana will go through um, in more, much more detail in the next talk, um, is the template for what your proposals should look like and what content it should contain. And so these documents are both available for download um, at this website. Um, and if you have any questions about those, feel free to contact either me or Ariana. Okay, so with that brief introduction, I'm going to now dive into my talk that actually focuses on what is LaserNet US. So I'm going to go through um, how we're organized, um, who the main people are in the organization, um, give you some quantitative numbers about um, the performance of LaserNet US um, in the first four years of operation. And then I'll work through three aspects of LaserNet US and kind of our core missions. So how you uh, providing access and networking opportunities, building the scientific ecosystem um, around the use of high power lasers, um, and then give you some introductory kind of get your get your mind kind of flowing about the different types of experiments that can be done on our facilities and um, more relevant to other kind of industrial applications or perhaps medical or biology applications that aren't aren't so so well pursued right now within our community. All right, so LaserNet US um, is a network of 10 um, high power laser facilities that are geographically spread across North America. So we've got a number of facilities that are located at national laboratories. So we've got uh, the Jupiter Laser Facility at Lawrence Livermore, uh, Matter and Extreme Conditions at SLAC, Bella at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, um, Omega at University of Rochester LLE. And then we've got a number of uh, lasers that are based at universities, uh, university facilities. So we've got a good uh, distribution, kind of 50-50 of those. Um, and each of these facilities um, operates um, with a little bit different um, operational uh, procedures or uh, kind of user operations. Um, so it's really important that um, whenever you're looking at proposing an experiment that you start to become familiar with the kind of the uniqueness of each of these facilities. Um, and so by putting bringing these uh, 10 facilities together, um, we have formed a mission of LaserNet US to really advance and promote ultra fast laser science and applications. Um, so the first one of these in order we've come together and formed our network. So what does this network look like? So LaserNet US was formed by the US Department of Energy Office of Unit and Energy Sciences in 2018. Um, and this is our current organizational structure. So as we've grown, we've had to adopt a more formal um, management structure in order to really serve the needs of our user community. Um, so my myself, I'm the LaserNet US coordinator and I fall within the LaserNet US management branch, which is also um, also set up by the uh, Douglas Schumacher and Ming Sheng Wei um, as our chair and vice chair of LaserNet US. And then we have um, a number of subcommittees which have various different functions within LaserNet US. So first is our network facilities committee. So this has a representative from each of the 10 facilities um, and they really are responsible for um, holding a grant from DOE FES um, in order to execute and carry out the experiments that have been allocated on, on the 10 facilities. Um, they also play an important role in the strategic directions and planning for the network um, and pushing initiatives forward at the, at the network level. Um, next, we have the Intense Light Users Engagement Committee. So the, actually the committee that's running this event here today. Um, and they function similar to uh, user groups from many of the mid to large scale user facilities around the world. Um, and it's their responsibility to represent the user's interests within the network. Um, next two are uh, two of our branches of the of LaserNet US. 
um, to support users in developing and using diagnostics and also integration of simulations in design, execution, and analysis of experiments. So diagnostics and simulations are two very key components in designing um, complex and successful experiments with high power lasers. Um, and by bringing these two committees together, our goal is to provide uh, resources to specifically new users and people from maybe outside of our community um, so that they don't have to go through that initial learning curve um, right from the start. Next, we have, again, very relevant to our conversation today, the proposal review panel. So this is chaired currently by Dr. Ariana Gleason. And the panel consists of about 20 subject matter experts from the various different uh, topical areas um, that are currently investigated within LaserNet US. And it's their role to con conduct a review of these proposals um, and rank them according to the evaluation criteria set forth in the proposal. Um, and lastly, we have a scientific advisory board with um, leading experts in high power laser science and applications from around the world. Um, also representatives um, on this on our scientific advisory board from some of the major other facilities like Eli Beamlines, um, in order to make sure that we're still on the right track, that we're pursuing the best science um, and making decisions to really grow the network um, and, and move forward with our growth. So I just want to take a moment just to highlight the IU's committee itself, um, since that's why we're here today. So the IU's committee is chaired by Dr. Ronnie Shepard and Dr. Amina Hussain. Um, and then we have um, a number of people that have uh, defined roles within uh, that committee. So Scott and Jennifer have um, taken the lead on running this workshop this year. Um, and I will just quickly mention um, Miriam uh, here, who's been doing a tremendous job with our social media um, as our outreach um, representative on the IUs to really make sure that everyone has the most up-to-date information and about our events and things that are going on. So the IUs itself, um, their ma major role here is to support the users on the facilities, um, to make and forge collaborations between the community and to grow the community, especially making ties with in industry partners. Um, and lastly, it, we want them to really um, promote training and education effort of students. So taking um, and guiding us um, in developing the best programs and initiatives that we can to uh, launch people into successful careers in laser, laser plasma or laser matter interactions. Okay, so Laser Night US, um, has many different parts to it. Um, so we'll just go through those kind of um, in sequential order and how they are driving the, the science of LaserNet US. So the first one is actually access and networking. So LaserNet US um, has a um, large, as I mentioned, 10 facilities. So we've got a number of these facilities that go into the kind of the realm of commercial type sapphire systems. Um, and then we've got some of these longer pulse, higher energy lasers, um, ND glass, ND mixed glass type laser systems. Um, so these are our kind of our, our, our collection of short pulse laser systems. Um, but we also have access to two longer, well, three longer pulse laser systems through Omega EP, Janus at Livermore, and LCLS at NEC. And so really the, the very broad range of laser capabilities now allows users to, um, and providing access to such large laser parameter spaces, allows us to, uh, or allows us to enable our users to design experiments for the science that they're most interested in, and then apply for access to the facility that most closely matches those. Um, and so this is kind of a shift compared to um, the previous generations um, in our field where experiments really had to be designed for where you could get access, whether it was your home institution or the user facilities that um, you, pre you had experience to. So we really want to switch that. We really want to have people um, apply for places where um, the laser most closely matches the science that they want to do. So up until now, um, of our 10 facilities, so we've had four calls for proposals now. So I just want to point out here, so this is um, the first cycle, which was in 2019, up until this year of the experiments that are currently being performed at our facilities. Um, so on average, we've, we have had um, an increasing in the number of proposals that have been submitted from about 40 to 65. But what's really exciting to see here is that with um, our current uh, resources provided by FES, we are able to allocate a very large number of the proposals that are submitted to LaserNet US. And so the, the acceptance rate is, is above 
50% in most of our cycles so far. Um, and so of these, the, of the success, the experiments that have been allocated on our network, um, you can see here our distribution of participants. Um, and so we've got a very good distribution of uh, scientists from, from very different career levels. Um, so what's really great here is that we've got large participation by graduate students, postdocs, and undergraduate students um, within these experiments from a range of institutions, a very large number of institutions actually, from uh, both domestically, which we consider as the, as US, the US, and then um, internationally as well. So the one of the biggest things about LaserNet US um, is that we want to um, push to reestablish uh, US leadership in high power laser science. And so all, as you probably know, um, in the last, um, the last decade or so, the US has really fallen behind um, in the development of new facilities and pushing the frontier um, in high power laser science. And so what's really exciting is the momentum that we have in the US in the past couple of years um, has really allowed us to start planning and start moving towards the development of three new high power laser facilities in the US, which will push and surpass the current state of the art and put us back on the map. So that includes the MEC Matter and Extreme Conditions Upgrade Project at SLAC, the Zeus uh, Petawatt at the University of Michigan, and hopefully maybe one day the Omega EP Opal system, which is expected to be up to 75 petawatt um, and two kilojoule laser systems. And so with these, um, we really would obtain a, a new state-of-the-art driver capability within North America, um, which is a great way for us to, to build community around these exciting new laser capabilities. All right, so next is workforce and community growth. Um, and so with these new capabilities, um, it's important for us to build the network around that and people that are able to do the best science on these facilities. So how are we doing that with LaserNet US? So this workshop you're here to attending today is one of those initiatives. And so we're really trying to develop uh, proposal writing work uh, resources to support new users. So people that are coming in from um, fields or top research areas that are not our conventional users or not expert users, as we would call them. So this workshop is one of those. And the recording of this um, workshop will be um, be posted to our YouTube channel after this event so that people can refer back to it um, as they're working on the proposals or in future calls. Um, and something that we did this year um, which was a request from our users during the 2022 LaserNet US users meeting, um, is actually the development of a proposal template. Um, and so in this template, what our goal is to do is to really provide detailed instructions and examples and writing prompts so that if you're doing this for the first time, that you can walk through it in a methodical way and really fill it out section by section and know that you're providing the information that the proposal review panel is looking for. And so Ari will talk about that a little bit more. Um, something I want to also mention is because we are, um, one of our key missions here is to grow the community um, and build a sustainable uh, scientific ecosystem around high power laser, um, is that we actually have a strong prioritization of the broader impacts of the research, in addition to the more conventional intellectual and scientific merits. And so the things we want you to think about when you're preparing your proposal um, is first the impact on the scientific ecosystem. So questions like who benefits? Um, are you bringing in new people to the community? Is it a new research area? Um, are you engaging with a new community of people through this work? Um, but also impacts on workforce. So are you are you training students? Are you um, are you contributing to growth of the community in the fields? Are you have are you establishing cross collaboration or increasing the interdisciplinary nature of the research? Um, and all of these things allow us to really come together and, and build that, that community around these, these facilities. Um, so kind of just in line with the, the, the workforce development aspect of this, um, I want to highlight that LaserNet US encourages students and early career researchers to be lead PI. Um, and so these are one of the ways in which we are providing opportunities and training opportunities um, for people to um, kind of accelerate their, their scientific careers in, in this field, in this area. Um, so not only is it a great learning experience to go through and design and execute your own experiment, um, but this is also a way to um, kind of take ownership and leadership of your specific research. And the LaserNet US provides the support to do this. 
And so you can see here on the left, um, a number of our, our student PIs that we've had um, in experiments to date. Okay, and so as our community has grown, um, we have uh, uh, thankfully we were able to go back in person this year and kind of see all the new faces that have begun to engage with LaserNet US um, throughout the pandemic years. And so we just concluded this uh, workshop um, in, in August. So it was hosted by Colorado State University um, and we had over 165 attendees. And what's really cool is that um, over 43% of the contributed talks were delivered by graduate students on research that they performed um, through LaserNet US awarded experiments. Um, and so what we're hopeful for is that these are going to be one of our greatest avenues of bringing our community together um, and, and for forming collaborations and, and really uh, developing that healthy network and ecosystem. So lastly is the science. And so this is our, um, LaserNet US aims to do um, the best science and the access, networking, workforce and community growth are really vital um, aspects of driving the best science forward. So I just wanna give you a, a quick taste. I don't have too much time left here. Um, just about the, the areas that um, we can investigate using high power laser technology. And so there are a wide number of applications um, that have that have been proposed and partially demonstrated, um, but also are actively pursued. So these range from medical, specifically what I'm interested in, so like laser-driven proton sources for cancer therapy, through to XUV lithography um, and XUV sources for uh, use within the semiconductor, semiconductor industry for inspection and things like this, to inertial confinement fusion and things like non-destructive imaging or in identifying internal flaws and defects. In, in manufactured components. So what does this look like so far in our network? So our networks um, up until now has followed many of the more conventional high energy density, um, high power laser science research areas. So these have ranged from kind of astrophysics, like lab astrophysics through magnetized plasmas, um, ion and electron photon sources, and more recently into a bit of plasma photonics. And so this is kind of the breadth of our current laser net US um, community, which is really taking advantage of um, our current network facility capabilities. Um, so we have high intensity laser pulses at high repetition rate, which is allowing us to do um, larger, more statistically based uh, research, um, low signal level type experiments. We've got multiple beams available at some facilities with the ability to do pulse shaping. Um, and our our facilities and our network have been really pushing the frontier of high repetition rate targetry and diagnostics. And so with this, um, we've recently been looking into what, um, what capabilities we could add to the network to even enable more, um, more science. And so this is one of the areas of um, kind of that's being pursued by the Matter and Extreme Conditions Upgrade Project, which will add uh, several new capabilities to the network. Okay, and then, uh, just to wrap up my talk, I'm going to give you an example of three types of experiments that have been done so far. Um, so this one is a really exciting um, experiment that was done um, by, uh, by a team from LANL at, um, at the Colorado State University, where they were developing a laser-driven gamma X-ray source that they could use for tomographic imaging of components. And so you can see here the comparison between a conventional uh, photon source and the laser driven source here. And you can see the, the really high resolution imaging that's being um, obtained with the, the laser produced source. And then here on the right is a reconstructed tomograph of an object that was done um, at CSU. Um, so it really looks quite impressive here. Um, next is an application that is in the direction of medical applications. So this is an experiment that was performed um, at the Bella Padawat Laser Facility, where they were looking to investigate the um, radiobiological effects at ultra high dose rates. So this is the flash um, RT effect, um, where a very high dose of irradiation is deposited in, um, in a cancerous tissue or in tissue, um, which has been recently believed to have more, um, more positive effects without so much damage to surrounding tissues. Um, and so this, in this experiment, they used the Bella, Bella Petawatt laser focused on a tape drive target, so a high repetition rate target to produce a 2 MeV proton source, 
which they use transport um, optics of so solenoids and magnets to deliver through on a cell or radiation assembly, which you can see here on the right. So in, in each of these cassettes, there was um, a, basically a small sample or a tissue sample, which then they deposited the radiation in. And then lastly, um, in a first of its kind of experiment uh, that was performed at the Advanced Laser Light Source in Montreal, Quebec, um, a group used the Betatron X-ray beamline in order to study the effects of different concentration of nutrients in plants, in, in live full-size plants. Um, and so what they were able to do is able to look how key mineral transport affected, um, affected the, the conditions of the plant itself. Um, and this is really important for um, looking at how plants behave under at, at the whole plant level rather than just like small, um, small kind of dice samples of those plants for things like how these plants will perform under under drought conditions or changing climate conditions and really making sure that we have um, that knowledge for the few food sources in the future. So as you can see, these experiments have a very large breadth um, and this is something that we really think will drive the different parts of LaserNet US so that we can expand, um, expand the network into um, less conventional areas. So just to conclude, so LaserNet US is, is experiencing rapid growth um, and starting to attract users from a broad range of topical areas from around the world. Um, we're taking a multifaceted approach to attract, um, attract and build the community. And in order to do this, um, thing, events like today's workshop here, um, we are trying to develop the resources to really support the users from, from these broader communities. Um, and I'll just leave you with that, just a reminder that the proposals for cycle five are due December 19th, um, at 4 p.m. And with that, I'll hand it back over to Scott. All right, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chandra Curry. Um, it's a wonderful overview. So now that we've talked about what is LaserNet US and you have a better understanding of what LaserNet US is and how it fits into the broader context, now we have invited uh, Dr. Ariana Gleason, the chair of the proposal review committee, to tell us about the most effective ways to prepare and uh, submit proposals. Great, thank you guys so much. Um, I I assume my audio is okay, and you can see the screen. Yes, Hopefully that's true. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, it's my pleasure to be here with you all this morning or uh, good afternoon or good evening, depending on your location. I'm the current chair of the LaserNet US uh, PRP, Propo Proposal Review Panel. And I'm gonna share with you um, our perspective and our approach in how we examine uh, each proposal and provide feedback and, and ranking. So crafting a successful proposal. Uh, first, a little bit about myself. Um, I've been here at Slack for a little over 10 years. Um, I'm a staff scientist. I also have an adjunct faculty position in geological sciences down on campus. Um, and I've been involved and engaged in high pressure uh, research uh, pretty much all, all of my academic career. Um, I did uh, work at Los Alamos National Laboratory for a while um, before coming here. Um, and I'm engaged in a number of different committees, um, both in, in the, at the DOE level, but, but also um, in the context of uh, serving on review panels for other light sources. So whether that's the advanced photon source or the advanced light source, um, I, I am also on the other side where I'm engaged in, in writing and reviewing proposals myself. And then other sorts of reports and, and roundtable. Um, so I, I do like to uh, engage both inward facing uh, toward the community and engaging and understanding where, uh, where are the, the research opportunities, but then also outward facing to our sponsors and our supporters um, across uh, the U.S. And, and abroad. 
So the proposal review panel is responsible for evaluating both the uh, scientific and technical merit. Um, and we do this in, um, in an independent and confidential way. Um, we do come together as a full group of about 20 um, experts, and we have a range uh, of experts across a suite of, of topical areas. Um, and we're when this was established, uh, we we pulled from the best practices of our you know sister um, facilities, institutions, and um, uh, locations to establish our review process. Um, the submission uh, accumulation, the the proposals are are sent through a process here at Slack. And we've got a number of folks helping us, uh, supporting us. Uh, so you've already heard from, from Chandra, which is great as a coordinator. Um, myself, I'm the chair, obviously. I um, have served for a few cycles now, two cycles, and I'll serve one more um, year in cycle six. My predecessor, Tammy Ma, who really helped establish um, and kick us off in, in a really wonderful direction, served for the first three cycles through the, through the pandemic. And then you may also receive notifications from our administrator here, Paul Jones, who's a fantastic uh, individual, and he's also a part of the LCLS user's office. And some of that infrastructure and support from LCLS, we have ported over to utilize for our organization here for LaserNet as well. So our review process uh, has sort of five stages. There's a pre-review, um, and we've tried to help guide that um, structure of the review by providing uh, the template, which uh, Chandra has also mentioned. And so we hope that will be an asset. It will be a benefit and a, um, a way to enable uh, ease of, of more proposals. Um, and so sort of identifying, are we missing any major pieces of that proposal? And have we identified any conflicts of interest, COIs, on the reviewer panel side? That's step one. Step two is an assignment of the proposals to three uh, separate reviewers. That step is done uh, uh, by, by me, uh, that assignment. And in this way, we, I try to uh, ensure uh, that there's expertise uh, in reviewing that proposal, but there's also breadth so that we're getting um, information from different institutions, different backgrounds of folks um, in providing a review and an assessment of, of that proposal. Then we come together in, in step three in a, in a final PRP review process where we're all talking with each other um, this recently has been done remotely, but this year we get to see each other in person, which will be fantastic. Um, and we discuss, we discuss each proposal. Um, we articulate uh, and take note of the merit and the technical um, uh, ranking. The, um, then a consensus is achieved by the entire group. So this is not one individual strong arming, um, you know, or promoting their personal agenda. This is done very much in a transparent way. Um, and we collect that information uh, through written documentation and collate as best we can the uh, review comments to give back. And we give back comments on every single proposal, whether it's awarded time or declined. Um, at that point. Um, the next step is a feasibility assessment, and this is done in coordination with the facility uh, uh, POCs, points of contact, uh, or facility directors and management. Um, and that is uh, just an evaluation strictly on the technical feasibility, um, even considering if there's novel uh, opportunity and development of diagnostics. Um, not if it exists right now, but what is the potential for orchestrating that uh, experiment in the future? What are the needs? And that is shared with myself and with Chandra. 
so that we can see how that fits together. Then there's a, a feasibility, the, the final decision is made once the uh, official reviews have been um, collated and the feasibility is completed. And that uh, gives us our, our final award list. So I wanna dive into sort of two, component, two main components uh, that are articulated on the uh, template now, but I, I sort of wanna break it down for you one by one on specifically where we are as the PRP, as the proposal review panel, where we are really leaning in to, um, uh, into the proposal and looking at the details explicitly. So there are two components. One is scientific or intellectual merit, and the other one is broad impact, or what we're referring to now as uh, scientific ecosystem stewards. So how are we shepherding forward? How are we the stewards now of this uh, topical area, this community? And how are we embracing um, as many uh, different kinds of uh, scientific areas and, and people as we can moving forward? So they're both important. In fact, um, you know, the, the broader impact, as Chandra mentioned, is, is nearly equally important to the, to the science case or the technical case. And I should say here, it's not just discovery science merit, right? We are also looking for ways to engage uh, and push forward application space that is critical. So um, we say scientific merit, but it also could be technological advancement or diagnostic uh, work. So let's focus on the left-hand side first. Here, um, the originality, uniqueness, and, and, and scientific merit, this can be covered in your introduction. So each of these colored boxes, I've tried to indicate where uh, these key components will fit in the template. And, and I'm not gonna walk you through the template one by one by one, um, but what we've tried to do is be very detailed on guiding via questions or uh, key pieces to think about to help build the narrative. Um, so in the introduction, uh, again, we, we try to have a, a, a survey across topical area experts in the composition of the PRP, but it might be some aspect that's very new. So it's always good to introduce the topical area, um, the interest, the motivation, uh, the societal impact just a bit, bring that forward um, and, and use appropriate references so that we can do our homework in trying to understand um, how your work is, is clearly justified and, and of, of merit in this way. Um, the second part is a, a workable hypothesis or series of key questions. This is really important and I, and I love to mention this. Um, it's challenging, but having a hypothesis-driven approach or narrative arc through your proposal will help us understand step-by-step step how you're leveraging really the, the scientific method in tackling what you've put forward first off in your introduction as the need, right? We, we must tackle X, Y, Z, um, and we're going to do that in the, in the following way. It doesn't have to be if then statements like we learned back in middle school, but crafting um, text and, and figures around what are you testing specifically will really help us. Um, and that then applies not just in discovery science cases, but also in uh, technological advancements uh, and capability um, uh, efforts going forward. Um, these are all held equally important. So you don't have to be um, investigating foundational physics at stellar interior conditions. You could be developing a, a key diagnostic that will move the bar forward. These, these are all held um, equally well. And then coming back to which laser and facility is most appropriate for that work, that will then fall in your experimental detail section and chart it out for us. You could provide uh, key parameters that are listed on the LaserNet or facility website that are 
are needed, are necessary for your work or a range. And if you have questions on uh, what parameters will be most important to you, especially if you're new to laser um, experiments, laser work, but you think there's a, a path forward here for leveraging uh, laser technologies for your science, ask us. So that's the second um, part is let, we are your resource, myself, Chandra, the IUS committee, that's part of their um, thrust is to make sure we're informing the community. This in, in turn then grows our community. So that's a key aspect of our stewardship um, uh, that we hold very uh, as very high um, here in the in the LaserNet organization. Um, let's see. So that's the science scope. I've grayed out this organization and conception piece because we've attempted to capture that for you by providing the template. So if you follow that, and and, and I don't mean just you know, making bullet points one by one, answering yes, no under each of the questions, but craft a narrative, leveraging the questions that we've prompted for, for, your, for your thought process. Um, so that's, that's the direction we, we wanted to go. So stewardship, broad impact, uh, or stewardship of the community and broadening the, the scientific ecosystem, and broader impact. So this is really important. And all of these aspects are important, even though I've grayed some out, but I want to draw your attention to two in particular. And this will go again in your sort of broad impact section. Um, how, how are you growing the community? So the in the context of encouraging um, early career student effort and, and describing that or having it listed out not just in your um, um, appendix where you're list, uh, you actually list the, the tentative technical uh, crew that you'll have, but spelling it out for us. Uh, you know, these, these data or this effort supports uh, the thesis of so on and so forth, this person. Um, it is a critical piece for my early career proposal in so on and so forth submission. Right, so how how is it actually linked back to um, to that cross collaboration of of fields? So Chandra gave some really nice examples that that might be non standard in say biology and chemistry, in manufacturing or industry. Um, we're looking to grow. That's an uh, underpinning message, and in order to do that, we have to educate each other. Um, I'm not an expert on um, leveraging, investigating something for particular medical application, but we can share with you, you know, what appropriate tools might give you certain resolutions or certain diagnostics might give you insight into a process. And so um, bringing uh, different individuals together with different skill sets that make up your technical group or your um, proposal uh, team members is going to be key. And we will look at that. Um, student in early career. I, I already mentioned that, but for workforce development in our community, but even more broadly across the different DOE programs and different sponsors, um, this is really important in STEM, uh, uh, science, uh, technology, and, and mathematics. We we have to make sure that there's a future workforce uh, ready to go to tackle our very important problems of the future. And this network, this LaserNet US and this community is, is a part of that thrust. Here's what we don't want. <laughs> so I, I bring this up and um, in, in, in this is just an example. We didn't intend to list out these questions such that you then simply answer yes or no. Uh, or provide a one-line uh, response that isn't a complete sentence. In fact, don't embed your response in our in the questions provided here. We're looking for you to take this uh, sort of prompt and consider crafting a, a really holistic, um, thorough narrative that walks you through all these different pieces. So please, please don't just answer in there. Um, and uh, some of the other details about 
space uh, limit, character limit are really important and in referencing, because like I said, we are not experts across the board and everything, but we will do our homework to understand the details and the context of the work you're proposing um, by looking up those references. Okay, what to expect um, after proposal submission has completed. Um, we will meet as a full PRP all together and discuss um, each proposal one by one in February of 2023. So we will do that in person this year. And at, it's at that point where we uh, are able to start collating the review uh, details. Um, and then we will compose a letter for every single proposal uh, with those details, whether it's uh, awarded or declined. Um, and we try, I think my predecessor as well, Tammy Ma and myself, um, we're not, trying to just say what's what's wrong or or what is missing um or some flaw we we hope my goal personally and i think across the community and the leadership at lasernet us is to indicate how to improve so that next time if you are declined if it didn't make it through that there is a path forward for improvement such that the next time up you're able to get time awarded, that there's a, a clear pathway. And if that is not coming through in the reviews, if you need more clarification, I am I welcome comments, um, criticism of, of that aspect. I, I take that responsibility um, because it's important for the community to grow that we have that transparency and open dialogue. So um, please let me know. And uh, I think in the Q&A, we can, we can try to suss out some of that as well. But nevertheless, we, we collate the reviews and put it out there. And the announcements will hopefully be made earlier this, this go around, this cycle five. I know they were recently, this past cycle four was very late. Um, so we're aiming for March, spring 2023, nevertheless, and of course, our contact information is listed here at the bottom. And with that, I think my time is nearly at the end. There we go. And I will stop sharing. So I think we're going to pivot to Q&A or Scott will let me know. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Gleason. Um, the next part of our session, actually, we are coming up on the Q&A, um, but the next part of our session is actually on writing support resources that are new this year and also your next steps. So giving you some concrete steps to take um, after this session. Um, so let me just get my slides here for a second. Um, as I'm going through this, this is a good time for you to start formulating your questions for the panel that we're gonna have after this. So take a moment, write down your questions, and then when you're ready, post them into the Zoom Q&A um, over the next few minutes, while I'm talking about your writing resources, you can also be posting questions to get us ready for the Q&A. All right. Okay, so for the next few minutes before the q and I'm going to talk about the writing resources and your next steps. So you've heard now about what LaserNet US is. Um, and you've also heard about some of the tips for best practices for putting in proposals and what the review process looks like. But how do you actually go about doing the day to day operation of starting, especially if you're a new PI or a PI who's put together proposals before, um, but hasn't um, succeeded in getting through with time, or you just want to hear about what kind of concrete next steps you can take to make sure that you put your best foot forward for this process. So this year, for the first time, we've put together this idea of a Friday office hours from the LaserNet user committee. Um, and so we will bring in as many uh, resources as, as we can to these writing uh, support office hours so that you, especially if you're a new uh, student, someone who doesn't know even where to start for this whole thing, you can just come show up and um, get some help. So every Friday through December 16th from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Pacific, um, we'll be putting together a Zoom uh, office hours. You can just drop in. You can drop in at 10.15. You can drop in at 
any time in this window, that's how it works. Um, I put the uh, Zoom ID up here. Here, you can write this down now. And our first office hours is this Friday. Here are some things that you could do at this office hours. For example, if you don't know how to reach out to a facility, you could come and get help on that. If you don't know kind of like what sort of like proposal steps you need to take next, you can come get help on that. So this is a catch all for people, for you. If you are not sure what to do next, then the answer to that question is the next thing you should do is join the office hours and talk about what to do next. In addition, if you have general more or uh, general questions for LaserNet US, uh, maybe you're a more experienced person in the process and you have a specific question that needs a technical answer, um, or maybe you know exactly what you want to ask um, about LaserNet US, uh, then send these questions to Chandra Curry, the LaserNet US coordinator. Uh, here's her email right here. Um, so now that I've told you about some of the writing resources that we'll be providing, um, I want to talk to you about concrete next steps that you can take. So today, watch out for an email from us with, with the slides from today. These are a great resource for you to go back through as you're thinking about your proposal. Also today, review the list of facilities on the LaserNet US website. And as you're reviewing that list of facilities, you want to pick out not just necessarily a facility that you're interested in proposing your work to, but also a backup facility or maybe a couple backup facilities. Then reach out to these facilities. This is very important to start a conversation um, with the facilities to get a sense, for example, of what kind of diagnostics do they have? Um, if you've made an assumption about the diagnostics that you'll be bringing, is that the sort of thing that they could integrate? Questions like this are very important to get out of the way as soon as possible. Um, and another thing you can do is to go do a dry run submission to find out what kind of uh, materials are gonna be required of you for the December 19th deadline. This week, a good concrete action to do would be to continue a conversation or start the conversation with facilities to watch out for emails about uh, a recording of this webinar, which will take a couple of days to compile. Send your questions about LaserNet US to Chandra Curry. And if you don't know where to start at all, to come to the office hours on Friday um, to get support to help us point you in the right direction. In November, you'll want to be continuing your proposal writing um, and working with facilities, uh, including the backup facilities. There's also a virtual town hall on November 15th that you'll want to make sure to attend. Continue sending your questions to Chandra Curry, who will help you also route those questions to the right people. And continue if you are um, looking for writing support, um, then to come to the Friday office hours. We can also, at those office hours, help you get connected with mentors if your help needs are more detailed or you need some specific mentorship. We can also just route you to the right people to get more support. And then finally in December, um, it'll be time to put together the final proposal and submit it. Now, some of you may be new to this process and it might be intimidating to put in a proposal on such a short timeline. I wanna encourage you to um, consider that even if you're not going to submit for this proposal cycle to take advantage of the resources that we are providing this time to reach out to facilities and get a sense of what uh, facilities you could work with, how you could develop a research project. And then we will be continuing. This is, we are now in cycle uh, five, I believe. So we are now in a regular pattern of every year around winter time having a call for proposals. So even if you are new to the process and don't know where to start, going through all these steps this year, even if at the end you don't, um, you aren't quite ready for a proposal this year, this is a valuable experience that can get you ready to put in a really good proposal next year. Okay, so now that I've told you about writing resources and where you can get support, as well as giving you some concrete action items for what you can do after this uh, uh, proposal or writing workshop is over, we're gonna transition. Jennifer Ellie, another volunteer member of the LaserNet US user committee is going to be leading this panel. Um, with previously successful applicants. So Jennifer, anything you need from me as far as like slides to show during this part, just let me know. Thanks. Thanks, Scott. Yep. 
So panelists, if you could all turn on your videos and microphones, we should switch to a kind of group view. I still see Scott's screen. I don't know how to switch that quite frankly. Okay, a gallery view, there we go. All right. Thank you, uh, everybody, for coming today, and thank you, panelists, for uh, agreeing to help us answer these the users' questions as they come in. Uh, can we start off, panelists, if you would just give a, a short introduction of who you are, where you are in your career, what sort of experiments you've done? Um, so, Francisca, can we start with you? Sure. Um, so, I'm Francisca. I'm a PhD student at Technical University Darmstadt in Germany working full-time um, at Slack here in the higher genetic science division. Um, I have um, done one experiment through LaserNet US so far at the Colorado State University on high repetition rate uh, due to an acceleration from uh, liquid jet targets. And I actually have another one coming up um, next spring that is looking at extending that um, platform for neutron generation. So that's my, um, yeah sort of uh, experience with Liz and I, yes. Thank you. Dean? Hi, yes. Uh, I'm Dean. I'm at uh, Lawrence Livermore. Um, I have done two experiments through LaserNet, both at the Texas Petawatt uh, facility. Um, I'm working on uh, uh, focusing targets and how we can use those to like improve the x-rays and the proton acceleration. Um, previously, I was in the UK, um, most primarily working on like short pulse lasers and X-ray generation. Um, yeah. Thank you, Sophia. Hello, everyone. My name is Sophia, and I'm postdoctoral researcher at Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory. I've been PI of experiments um, at Omega and as well at high repetition rate facilities. Uh, here in US, I'm started to uh, to use laser in US for my experiments at CSU Aleph laser facility and now we have two experiments um, uh, one has been performed this year and next one is coming up and so yeah I would like to to share my experience and help everybody who is applying for it Thank you very much Sven Yes, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Sven. Uh, I guess I'm re representing the private sector here. Um, I'm responsible for experimental physics and engineering at Marvel Fusion, uh, located in uh, Munich, Germany. Uh, so writing proposals uh, from the user side, but before I spent eight years as a staff scientist at uh, Berkeley National Labs. Uh, where I was responsible also for the other side, uh, the hosting part uh, of um, LaserNet US experiments, among others. Thank you. And Sazi? Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sazi from Los Alamos National Lab. Um, I'm a scientist here, and uh, I have been doing short post laser experiments for about a decade or longer. Uh, laser-driven sources, x-rays, neutrons, and ions, and um, lately been doing more work on ICF later problems. And I have done laser net experiments both at CSU and Texas Petawatt, a uh, few experiments. Okay, thank you everybody. So let's start, uh, Francisca, if, if you would, in your experiments, in your experience, what was the main deciding factor on what uh, facility to apply to? Was there anything that you considered especially or any showstoppers? Sure. Um, I mean, I said that um, earlier already during um, talking about what I do. Um, so we were particularly focusing on high repetition rate. So those were the facilities that we um, picked out. We basically went through all the facilities that are available and I encourage everybody to just look at every single facility. Um, and then um, another thing that was important to us was um, we needed a laser that had high contrast because of our target. Um, so this is not something that's maybe important for everybody, but our liquid target really needed high laser contrast. So those two kind of paired together, narrowed down our selection of which laser facility to use. And then 
um, we ended up talking to two different laser facilities um, that would have been a gut match and then just kind of tiered them to first and second choice. Thanks. And I should mention for everybody that the facilities are on the LaserNet uh, website, both a map of where the facilities are. And then if you click on the little icons, there's a, a list of the facility capabilities. So you can look through those to kind of get at least a starting idea. Um, do any of the other panelists want to address how you picked a facility? Okay. Yeah, I would definitely agree with Francie. Uh, like you have to look at whole list of facilities and check all the characteristics and and obviously it would be nice to talk at least for two free facilities to decide on which one you want to use and ariana since we had this uh since we started with this question do proposers need to contact the facilities that they want to intend or can they just write a proposal blind so it's not mandated, but it's really encouraged. Um, and in fact, if you if you do have um, some description um, or or shared knowledge uh, dialogue with the facility point of contact or beamline scientists, mentioning that, um, you know, having a sentence that says, you know, we've we've articulated this proposal or shared ideas with the staff. And they find it feasible, not necessarily feasible, but that that sort of check has uh, has been um, addressed. Uh, that initiative was taken by the PI. That helps us see uh, the the viability and path forward um, from the PRP perspective. Whereas if it's something very new, uh, there's no mention made of discussion with staff or facility POC, um, and it's and it's sort of adjacent to what the current capabilities are of that facility, um, it does give us pause. So I'll, I'll say it that way, but it's not mandated. So you're not required. And, and I think each facility, maybe Chandra can give us the official definition um, for, you're not required to list them as um, uh, members of your team, the, the facility. Um, that's sort of up to each facility, I believe, uh, sort of how they have decided that. Um, but but asking questions is is sort of for free, so you can um, certainly do that. I don't know, Chandra, do you want to follow up? Yeah, okay, there. Sorry, I was just trying to answer a question in the, the chat box at the same time. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to echo exactly what you said. So um, we strongly, strongly recommend um, working with the, the facility point of contacts and the technical staff to um, to design your experiment, make sure that you identify anything that that may be problematic or showstopper, like we mentioned in the last question. Um, but this is really left up to the discretion of the the, the user group um, about the level and involvement of the facility personnel. Some facilities operate in kind of more the 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 user model, so. I'll give you the example of the Jupiter laser facility. There, it's it's a, a much more technical support staff. Um, they've been doing this for many, many years. Um, things are pretty, pretty systematic on how you would execute an experiment there. But if you look instead at maybe some of our university facilities, um, you really require that hands-on um, assistance and collaborative nature to, to do an experiment there. Um, so I think you'll find that your experience will really vary. And um, I think that we leave it up to your discretion about the amount of involvement and, and how you handle collaboration and, and authorship and all of these things. Ben, I see your hand is up. Did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, I, first of all, I wanted, yeah, absolutely. I want to absolutely second what Ariana and Chandra have said. So it, you should contact them as early in the process as you can, because they have all the resources uh, and you can evaluate feasibility. You don't want to be kicked out in the feasibility stage of your proposal because it doesn't work, but also because they are all scientists and they are extremely helpful and uh, can even participate in the quality of your proposal by helping uh, you putting that together and uh, maybe become a part of the team if you have some uh, synergies. Um, so go for it as early as you can when you think about it, pick your facility, contact them. 
Okay, thank you. Dean, I'm going to address the next one to you. How much time did you request in your proposal? And what does this depend on? Like, does it depend on the facility you're applying to or? I, I think, yeah, you, you've got to, you've got to have, um, depending on your goals of your experiment, you've got to have a timeline for you expect for a given experiment, the, uh, the university scale facilities and some of the other facilities, it's going to take you a week to set up and then try and achieve all the goals. So you, I, when I propose experiments, I normally think four to five weeks is a really good time schedule. But if you're a, the one of the, the outlier on the, um, on the laser net, um, uh, the list of laser net facilities, I think is Omega EP because Omega EP, you get a day or two, but that you will have a shot day where you're going to get a dozen shots and you, that it's very modular, all the diagnostics are modular and you don't really, you're not, it's not a hands-on experimental facility. So most of the other facilities, you're looking at a few weeks, Omega EP, you're asking for a day or two at most. Okay, thank you. And again, if you talk to facilities, they'll probably, if you say, I want this much time, they'll be like, well, that reasonable or no yeah yeah and i mean yeah. after you get accepted there's also the uh when we are going to put you we think we've got a slot for you here and we think you've got a slot for you there so yeah it's again communication with the facility is very important before and after ariana oh i just got answered live okay um uh, I guess I'm going to ask, are there any evaluation criteria or quotas that might put international PIs or collaborators at a disadvantage, or is there anything uh, international proposers need to consider especially? Um, if that's direct, I, was that for me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the answer is no. No, a anyone is welcome to apply. I think a PI should consider the composition of their team based on the needed expertise of, for each area. So if it's a domestic US PI uh, principal investigator and they need to reach out internationally to make sure they're composing their best team, uh, they should do so. Um, any international PIs, if your team is outside the US, then that's, that's also fine. There's no quota, there's no, uh, I think initially that you uh, folks might be remembering there was the very first cycle one uh, there were some other uh, considerations around international PIs, but since cycle one, none of that has come to bear uh, for our consideration uh, in, the, in the review process. So um, that's, that's my understanding. Thank you. Sven, as an international PI, do you have anything to add to that? No, of course, I, I can only say from the user side, I don't know whether there's a quota or not. Uh, absolutely no, but I haven't experienced any difficulties uh, applying from abroad, no. I, I guess I meant in, in like mm -hmm. building the team or any considerations like that. No, I can, as I said before, in building the team, I said the most important part is get the facilities on board, uh, discuss with them, use their resources, um, and get everybody on board. You need to pull off the, the project. Okay, thank you. Sophia, I see your hand up. Yeah, yeah I wanted to add, like, as previously international um, PI of experiment, we had 90% of our team was from Europe. And we had to bring our equipment and everyone to experiment at CSU. And this, this requires a lot of time. So if you're international PI, you just have to understand it's gonna take more time if you're in US in order to organize the experiment. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Scott, this is a somebody's writing their first proposal, uh, who should they ask for for help? Okay, so if you are writing your first proposal or thinking of writing your first proposal, congratulations. If you have a specific question, you can reach out to uh, Chandra Curry and she'll help direct that to the right person. If you don't even know where to start, um, perfect thing to do is to jump into the Friday office hours anytime, any Friday. 
uh, between 10 a.m. and 12 p.m. Pacific, and we will guide you on your next steps. Thanks. And, and to kind of follow up on that, Sazi, um, who did you speak with when you first had an idea for an experiment, or what was the first thing you started with? Um, that was for me, right? Yeah. OK. Um, yeah, I mean, we do a lot of internal uh, discussion before we reach out to facilities or laser net folks because we want to make sure that our idea is solid before we submit. So once we have an idea, then um, uh, it, then there are only you know one or two facilities that you have in mind where you want to do your experiment. So then. Uh, I will reach out to the point of contact for each facility. So if you go to the web page, then under each facility, you can know who's the point of contact and then reach out to them and basically check the feasibility of doing such an experiment, whether they have all the diagnostics, uh, what you need to bring, what do they have. So that sort of uh, questions what I have, typically have. So I reach out to the point of contact in each facility. Thank you. Chandra, I think we have a question for you uh, in the chat, which is uh, there's an undergraduate working in a lab at a LaserNet hosting university. Uh, would it be possible for them to do research at a LaserNet facility while doing grad school nearby? Yeah, I think that that's a really great opportunity and something that we can that we can look at. Um, if you're interested in submitting your first proposal, um, definitely reach out, attend office hours and start kind of building up that idea It's probably going to be usually I think we see that uh, graduate students start uh, proposing their own experiments kind of midway midway to upper level graduate studies. Um, but uh, getting involved and getting kind of participating and getting on your first experiments, um, I would I would recommend reaching out to the facility POC of the facility nearby, um, get your hands on and see if you can participate in a few experiments, and then we look forward to seeing your proposal in a few years. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is kind of an interesting one, Dean. I'll ask you to to start. Do facilities let you adjust all the equipment yourself where you expect to operate everything or what did you need to supply for your experiments? Sort of what are the expectations when you go into the experiments? So, I, yeah, the, when I've, I've only ever, so I've done experiments at Jupiter and Jupiter is a very well equipped facility. It's got a lot of equipment and a, a lot of Livermore staff can help out with the diagnostics that they've got at hand. But when we went to Texas, obviously that's, further away for me. So I I started by talking to people that had done experiments at Texas before and asked them what did they take? What did they need to take? <laughs> what did they need to take? And we learned what we needed to take and the equipment we needed to provide. In Texas, for example, we took uh, cameras, computers, and some four labs equipment that we knew were vital for the experiment. In terms of diagnostics, I mean uh yeah it's also really helpful to know what they have on hand and we again took a lot of our diagnostics that we knew were primary diagnostics for our experiment the it's it's good to it's good to if you if you're unable to like visit the facility or you've never visited the facility it's always also good to like um i know texas for example will provide you like a cad model of the of the chamber and you'll be able to actually like have a look at the size of things as well and where you can put things on the experiment but actually like having some photographs and uh, of the experiment or the area that you're going to be working in is very helpful for knowing what it's going to be like when you get there it's you've got to, uh, i would advise like familiarizing yourself with the facility not just what do i need to take and what do what diagnostics and cameras or stuff but actually knowing, will this diagnostic work on this facility? This can be, you know, communication is the, e communicating like often with as many questions as you can come up with is definitely the, the way to go, I would say. Thank you. Oh. And I wanna point out for people who wanna reach out to other PIs who have done experiments on a given facility, there's a list of successful past proposals on the LaserNet 
uh, website that you can look people up on. Chandra, did you want to address that too? Yeah, I guess I just wanted to to just add on what Dean said a little bit too. And I, when I've done my my LaserNet US experiments as well, um, something if you have the time and resources available as well, after you get an awarded experiment, we found it very very helpful to go on kind of a recon trip. So going out there and kind of experiencing what a shot day looks like, and kind of being able to take the measurements yourself and and um, kind of get that familiarity. Um, of course, this is kind of not relevant to today's discussion, but I would definitely say that that was a very valuable exercise. Thanks. And sort of along those lines, uh, Francisca, if you could answer who or where did you get the information you needed about the equipment that's available at the facility you're applying to? So we actually, um, once we had a point of contact for um, the experiment that we were going to do, we talked to them extensively about um, what we needed. And I think what is really important here, first of all, is to kind of be very sure of what you actually need, not kind of just sending an email being like, hey, what do you have? But just knowing what you need for your setup to work and be like, this is the equipment list that we have and what we need, tell us what you have locally. And that way we were able to kind of eliminate everything that they already had provided and that we then didn't need to bring. So I think, yeah, as I said, being sure of what you actually need is really important to like, communicate clearly with the facility. And so when did you, did you do that as part of the proposal process, like after you'd sort of roughed it in or like when did that, that discussion happen in the process? I think that was mostly actually after the proposal was awarded pretty immediately after I got my proposal awarded, I reached out to the facility. Um, before that, I was mostly just kind of concept talking about whether the experiment was feasible. And then right after it being awarded, it was more into the details of like, um, what do we need to make this happen? Yeah. yeah, I would say that it's kind of at like the very high level. Like for example, if you have like a complicated diagnostic that has very stringent vacuum requirements or you're fielding a new target delivery system, like these more complex system modifications that are beyond what are currently done at those facilities, these need to be talked about in advance. This is kind of where we identify if there's enough resources or manpower or expertise to field them. But once we get into like the very fine details of your proposal, like your optomechanics or specific optics you need, it, these are kind of the separation from the pre-proposal phase to the post-award phase. Um, and if you have any questions about what level of detail um, you should be in your design before you submit your proposal, feel free to reach out to me and Ari and we can give um, advice on that. Um, one of the things that the proposal template does require this cycle is like, for example, a beam path diagram. So we want you to already be thinking about where your primary beams are gonna be, where your diagnostics are gonna be, what diagnostics or vacuum requirements do you have? Um, but then the fine details of that would be sorted out after the proposal is awarded. Thank you. Sophia, I have a question for you. Uh, for preparation of the target hardware, um, do, do the facilities provide that? Can LaserNet provide some help? Um, yeah, targets is a thing to uh, think about in advance. And uh, we discussed about targets with the facility before actually submitting the proposal. Um, but in our case, it was thin foils, which are purchased from Goodfellow. And we had also some really special targets, which we purchased from uh, GSI uh, Target Fab. And that was done one year prior to experiment due to the difficulty of targetry. Um, so it depends on the experiment of the user, but LaserNet US provides supports on the targetry, which has to be requested. And this also has to put in the proposal when you're writing details about your targets. You can write it will be provided by you or by laser facility, or you will request some support on it. Thank you. Okay, let's uh, discuss a little bit about uh, support, monetary support. Um, Chandra, I guess this is a, a question for you. Is, is LaserNet able to support 
scientists who are traveling to experiments, so per diem housing, what about European uh, uh, scientists? Yeah, so we, um, in cycle four, um, we were able to provide um, really travel support to most user groups that did request it. Um, and, and we will be able to do target support and consumables. So, sorry, so travel and target or consumable support um, in cycle five. Um, so it's really, so within the actual proposal itself, um, there is, we, we don't want actually a specific request for funding anymore. If you've submitted with us previously, there was a field um, that has been removed this cycle. Um, if you do require support for your experiment and it, it won't be possible without that, really reach out to me and Kramer um, as soon as possible. Um, and we will kind of um, get, get you, get you and keep you in mind as we do this. Um, this cycle, we are going to have a formal application procedure for both travel support and consumable support, um, and the details on that will be provided to successful applicants, um, kind of simultaneous with the award letters in the spring. Wonderful. Uh, Ariana, are the proposal statistics posted anywhere? So, like, are certain labs more subscribed than others? Can you increase your chances of getting a successful proposal by applying to different facilities? Um, <clears throat> statistics are available. I think actually Chandra is the one who has collated that information from previous um, cycles. Um, alignment with certain laboratories. Um, I, I think first, first pass, no. I, I think an individual PI should again, just build, you know, a, a successful team based on where they need expertise. Um, if that expertise happens to be at all at a particular laboratory, um, that's fine maybe at a first pass, but then consideration of broader impact and expanding that to include students in early career and also consideration of different academic institutions is really important. And we also look for that as well. Um, so that's sort of the PRP perspective, but I think some of the statistical information, I'm gonna let Chandra jump in. Sure, okay. So um, I guess the way that I will explain this, so each facility within LaserNet US um, is contracted by DOE to do a particular number of experiments per cycle. These discussions are fluid and change based on the proposals that are submitted um, and the overarching availability and previous commitments at each of these facilities. So these, this information is not known a priori to the, the, the call itself. Um, what I would say is that um, I, you should be submitting to the facility that is going to enable um, your science um, and be the best supportive of that. But what I will say is that it's incredibly important and we really wanna emphasize um, applying to both primary and a secondary facility. Now, the way that um, we've formalized the language for this um, and way, the way that this will work um, or has worked, um, but maybe it wasn't so clear before, is that when you put in for a primary and a secondary facility, your proposal is first going into consideration for and competing at that primary facility. Now, it'll go through the evaluation from the PRP, so both scientific merit, broader impacts, um, and the technical feasibility. And if it doesn't reach the, the level at which it would be awarded, so we fill the slots that are available at that facility, if it does not reach the bar of being competitive, it then goes into the competition for the secondary facility. And again, it goes through this process. It'll be ranked against proposals at that, at that facility. Now, in some instances, I mean, our, our PRP has really, really extensive experience at our facilities, but also within the community. Um, and sometimes they identify cases where maybe a third facility that you weren't maybe aware of or didn't weren't quite familiar with might also be possible. So if we don't get, if we don't aren't able to schedule it for primary or secondary, sometimes we'll provide a recommendation for a third facility. Um, and that that transfer to that last facility um, is something that we would contact the spokesperson about. We would ask them um, and, and provide that as an option to still be awarded time. And the spokesperson has the option to accept or deny that that final transfer and perhaps work on uh, updating the proposal and resubmitting it in another cycle. So we, it's really our goal to schedule as many experiments um, as possible within, within what is available through the, through the network. Okay, so 
I guess I'm going to send this question to Sten. Um, what do you do? So there's a facility that has exactly the laser parameters you want. They're basically perfect, but they don't have some diagnostic equipment or some key critical component. Um, what do you do at that point? Well, I first of all, I have to uh, say sorry for my unstable internet connection. Uh, but you have you have a few choices, right? Uh, I guess you can uh, support uh, request support in your proposal to develop the the diagnostic in the time uh, leading up to the experiment. Um, then you can, of course, uh, design and provide the diagnostic. Um, yourself as the PI or in institution, because keep in mind that the spirit of LaserNet US was also to advance the hosting facilities by diagnostics as the cycles continue. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, we can hear you really well. Thank you. Yeah, so okay. Uh, and uh, this is, of course, I guess, also seen by the PRP as a strong uh, argument, uh, because if the facilities are getting better and uh, fellow users uh, are able to use their diagnostics in future experiments, the community is growing and uh, success is underway. So would you consider doing kind of a, a staggered proposal where one year maybe you propose to develop a diagnostic with the facility and then the next year you propose to use it? Is that feasible? I, would, I guess so, but I, that would be more a question to Chandra how, how this is uh, perceived. Um, at least you should mention that in your proposal that you plan uh, successive, uh, more like establishing a research path uh, that you outline in your first proposal and then um, describe what your steps are in phase one, phase two, and so on as you go through uh, the uh, cycles of LaserNet. So that's how I would do it, but I don't know what's that's the official track. No, that, that's exactly correct. And so we see this as yeah. a, what's called a scientific campaign. And so we understand that um, access to these facilities is sometimes necessary in developing diagnostics or platforms. Um, and so by within your proposal itself, if you explain exactly the phases, so that phase one, we're going to build that diagnostic, we're going to we're going to field it, commission it, calibrate it. Um, that takes this beam time, and then that will be used, and then really kind of give us the that description of the path or the way from like the development stages required for you to get to, to that scientific or technical result that you're pursuing. Um, we, we are very much in welcoming of these kind of platform or technical capability development type proposals, um, but it's really important to still provide the context of why that is important to the research or the, the technical area that you are coming from. Thanks. Okay, Scott, I have a question for you from the chat. Um, so maybe there are people who have submitted proposals and gotten rejected and gotten feedback, um, or, or maybe they haven't gotten very useful feedback. Are the office hours gonna include some tips on writing proposals based on previous rejections? Um, yeah, you're welcome to come and talk about it. Although for specifics about previous cycles, I would recommend you reach out to Chandra Curry because she will actually have access to previous cycles information. Um, but if you're looking for how do you craft a better proposal this cycle, definitely you can come to the office hours and we'll help you. Thanks. Dean, um, have you ever submitted, like, do all the ideas have to be Oh, this is easy. It's it. There's a clear path. Or what about like a, a high risk, crazy idea? Uh, I I think if you have something that is high risk and it's crazy, uh, I mean it shouldn't be too crazy, but it should have. If it's high risk, it should it should be paired with something. I, I in my opinion, something that's high reward at the same time. So if you're trick, if you're chasing. Uh, a wonderful nature paper that depends on a particular result 
and you can convince the reviewers that um, the high risk and the high reward are very well paired to, uh, with one another. I think that's a fine thing to submit. Um, my personally, I always try to have achievable goals that you know this experiment. If if I don't achieve this high risk high reward thing, that you can fall back on. So there is going to be stretch goals and achievable goals on a particular experiment and depending on the success of the experiment you know you will get something out of it it won't be a waste but um i guess um it's all about trying to uh, trying to convince the reviewers that this even though it's a, a crazy idea but it has a sound uh, scientific base and it's actually it's it is achievable even though it does sound crazy i think it's about trying to construct the best argument about the um uh about the idea awesome uh sazi i have a question for you targets can be uh really expensive do you make your own targets or where do you get them or where do people look to get them are there groups you could collaborate with that have in-house uh facilities that would be helpful for people to know as they're writing proposals yeah, so the targets, um, so, we, so we do make uh, most of our targets in-house at Los Alamos, and then we also collaborate with the universities to make targets for our experiment, depending on the nature of the experiment. So if it's a higher rate target as opposed to uh, experiments at Te Texas Petawatt where you get only five, six shots, it's very different. And also, if you're doing, you know, liquid hydrogen jet type target, then that's different. So it really depends on whether your target is really simple foil type target or you're going for like a, you know, some custom target. So, but a lot of um, these uh, LazyNet user facilities, you know, they also have in-house target fabrication capability. So, if it's sort of a collaborative work with with one of these users, you can definitely start to uh, you know work with them on targets as well. Um, so it really depends on exactly what type of target you're talking about. And this is something uh, I don't think there is one answer that would fit to this question. Okay, and I do want to say that there's uh, on the LaserNet website there's a like target diagnostic and and target group that you has contact information that you can reach out if you're really kind of lost on this or you could come to, to office hours and ask for um information on the subject uh Sven, so for for private companies um how is intellectual property handled for for laser net experiments do the, the experiments have to be publishable? Yeah, as as far as I know, uh, LaserNet US is uh, fully supporting open science uh, at this point. And we, for example, as Marvel Fusion, pursue our experiments also in the open science uh, community with publishable results. Um, there may be some ways and developments within FES to further support uh, proprietary information um, for, for private companies. But I think at this stage, uh, it's, it's open science and service to the community. Chandra, can you add anything to that? Yes, that's exactly right. So we're currently working um, within LaserNet US to develop a um, additional access channel um, for proprietary research where there would be um, intellectual property agreements between the proposing group um, and the LaserNet US facility to, to maintain that, um, that confidentiality of those results um, that would, would not be published, that they would be proprietary for the, the company itself. Um, this is a work in progress. Um, we're hoping to have uh, this, this launched within the next couple of years. Great. Uh, Francesca, so the laser specifications for all the facilities obviously are on the website. Um, what does a, a proposer do if their experiment needs a really specific requirement that isn't on that website. 
So um, the way I've approached it in the past is just kind of like look at whether the general sex would fit your um, your experiment. And if then there's some like one or two things that are um, either not defined or just kind of a little bit off from what you would need, I'd just reach out to the facility because a lot of times there have been experiments that have explored special cases for laser parameters at that facility that are just not listed on the website. Um, so it's just really um, important to reach out to the facility staff and ask them about what has been tried in the past, um, or even if there's any uh, opportunity for them to do some sort of like test runs or measurements at the laser parameters that you would be interested in. And a lot of times that's possible. So yeah, you, you would reach out to the facility and see what's doable. And uh, a question for Dean. Um, when you did your experiment, are like how does the, the laser net interaction work? Are the facility staff uh, collaborators? Do you include them as co-authors on the publications, or are they just providing a facility for you to use? I I personally do provide uh, because um, uh, it's not when you go to a place like Omega or you go to a place like NIF. Um, you are kind of interacting with the facility more than you're interacting with individual people. But when you go to a facility like uh, a university scale facility, you the people there are vital to the success of the experiment. Um, and I, the communication that you have, and the, it is a collaboration because um, you learn things about the laser and the if you're if you're using parts of their for example, if you're using high repetition rate targets that are provided by the facility or diagnostic provided by the facility, they are providing uh, a lot of additional support. So I, I personally, um, uh, I, I'm not sure if I've included them as part of the proposal team, but I definitely include them on the publications uh, afterwards because, um, well, I feel like their support was vital for any success that I've ever, ever had at their facilities. Um, the um, uh, particularly, yeah, it's and uh, most of the experiment, most of the work is done prior to you getting to the facility anyway, you know, discussing about the laser parameters you want to operate with or diagnostics. And um, particularly on the last experiment we did at Texas, I um, uh, they had a, a PhD student that uh, wanted to help out. And we actually spoke about like what kind of results that he would like to keep from the experiment and um, the, the collaboration between us as the like the team coming in and them as the support team. It was like um, the, sometimes they would like something out of it as well. And it was they provided a student, a full time student for the entire experiment. And I was able to you know offer you know, support with, hey, you this this will be really helpful for, you know, writing up. So yeah, but it was definitely, uh, definitely keep them as a, um, I definitely put them as collaborators more than anything. So kind of to follow up to something you said, I'm going to ask Ariana, does LaserNet uh, require that the facility personnel are listed as collaborators on the proposal? So do they go in the tentative research team on the proposal? No, um, it's not required. Uh, I think what would be great is an indication, um, probably in the experimental details section uh, that you've discussed. You know, we've reached out to the facility staff or POC to discuss um, X Y Z aspect of this work. So you're you're flagging for us that that some conversation is taking place, but mandating the inclusion of those folks on your um, team is not required from a PRP perspective. I think it's up to each individual, you know, to decide what level of engagement or agreement is made with the staff and scientists at the at each facility. Um, and so it's sort of it's sort of up to each person, but flagging that a discussion has been, especially if it's a new diagnostic, a new aspect, a change or deviation from what's traditionally available at that facility. Um, some indication just in a quick sentence or a few sentences is uh, appreciated and, and probably appropriate. 
Uh, Sazi, there's a question in the Q&A chat that is really specific to you. I don't know if you can uh, go in and, and answer that in the chat. It, I think Ronnie just answered it, so it should it's in the answer category, but somebody was looking for, for contact information for, for you from about targets. Um, so I guess, uh, Francisca, I'm gonna ask you this. What did planning and preparing for your experiment look like, especially as like a, a younger PI? Um, and, and is there one piece of advice you give to a new user? Um, so I think the first thing that I did was just talking to people who have, um, have who already planned experiments in the past. Because the first, I think, initial step and really important thing is to make sure that you think of everything and that you meet your timelines that you need to meet. So talking to people first, making uh, a checklist for yourself of like, what do you need to think about in terms of experiment, but also just in terms of other logistics, like shipping things to the facility, bringing people to help, like who's available when, all of this stuff. Um, I really recommend people just making or like first time PIs, making a checklist by talking to other people who've done this in the past. Um, and then it was just kind of like about um, meeting those timelines and just keep talking to people who have experience. So I checked in with people um, with especially like senior staff members here at Slack about my timelines and about my steps um, just to make sure that I was considering everything in the right way. I was not missing anything. Um, so working closely with them was the key thing to like the success of planning my experiment. Does anybody else want to add anything to that? I guess, I, I mean, I, what Franzi explains is I think the, the best advice here, right? If you haven't done it before, really rely on people that have, have whether it's at your own institution, or I would also recommend reaching out to other people that have done experiments at those facilities before. So the, the list of the people that have been awarded time there um, is posted on the LaserNet US website. And if this is your first time doing an experiment or proposing an experiment at a particular facility, I, I would personally be reaching out to them and trying to see and identify a scheduling meeting to discuss um, what, what the experiments look like there or what specific things are different. Um, and I would probably have that, that line of communication open as well during the planning phase um, if you don't have the local expertise um, at that particular facility. Better if I unmute myself. Sven, do you have a, a follow-up? Uh, yes. And again, I can just add on what, what others have said, and we have stressed it a lot during the session that contacting the facilities early on is the, is the keys to success and learning about the, the parameters in the lab, other than what is listed on the website, is also key. But also, and I think Dean mentioned that before, is that the facilities within LaserNet US differ tremendously, right? You have national lab facilities on the one hand uh, and in, and you have university scale experiments on the other hand, right? You have Omega EP where everything is in a framework uh, and almost no modification to standard diagnostic is, is, is possible or at least not easy. And then you have university labs like OSU or, or CSU where you can basically be creative and build your own setup from, from scratch. So it's, uh, it's learning about the differences of the facilities. And, and this is just to just stress again, to work with the hosting facilities as early as you can. Yeah, definitely a theme probably once you have your idea kind of fleshed out and know what you want, contact the facilities as early as possible. Um, Chandra, on that note, do the, so all the facility specs are listed on the website, but do they match the most up-to-date offerings or how often are those lists updated? 
So we are doing an update of those um, of the laser parameters that are on there on a regular basis. So at least once or twice a year. Um, and we, we do try to capture kind of the most, um, the, the kind of the overarching laser specifications that most users are going to request at those facilities. Um, now, they're not comprehensive. Um, Franzi mentioned, for example, like the two omega contrast at CSU uh, was something that we were very interested in for our last experiment there. Um, that was something that we really wanted to, to get that measurement, see that measurement from the facility um, to be sure that our experiment would be possible there. Um, so I would say that, at, while we try to um, keep that as up to date as possible and as comprehensive as possible, if there's something that really is important to the design of your experiment, um, really make sure that you uh, build that into your conversation with the facility. Um, ask for the measurement, ask for the data, um, talk to them about um, if, if there have been changes in recent performance, maybe one of the amplifiers isn't working as well or something like this. Um, really ask those questions while preparing your proposal and then also leading up to your experiment. And I, I think this there's a relevant question that was answered in uh, text in the Q and A, but I'm just going to read it so that people can can have it in mind. Uh, is there a certain point in time in the proposal timeline when we might be given a specific point of contact within LaserNet based on our objectives facilities, or if we keep saying reach out to the facilities, how do you find the contact information to reach out to the facilities? And Chandra points out that on the LaserNet US website under the facilities every facility has a designated point of contact. So that should probably be your, your starting point to, to reach out to those folks. Okay, so we're uh, quickly coming to an end. Um, Scott, I wanna turn it back over to you. Um, if people have questions after the meeting, who can they ask? Uh, what sort of resources are available? You went over those slides. And, and I do want to mention that these slides will be posted. Um, they'll be sent to all the participants and the recording of the call will be posted in a couple of days for everyone to get to. Okay, thank you very much. So we are at the conclusion of today's event. Um, I would like to conclude by summarizing points, main takeaways that I'd like you to leave with. It's free facility beam time in a competitive process that's open to all, including graduate students and um, any new PIs. Effective proposal writing involves facility coordination and consideration of the broader impact of your project on the LaserNet US community. We have outlined concrete action steps for you to take today and over the next few months. Um, both LaserNet US and its user community have resources to support you uh, through this process and upcoming events to keep an eye on. Um, use these resources even if you're just getting ready to prepare for the next proposal review cycle. Um, and thank you to our panelists and organizers today. And thank you for coming and uh, giving us your time. Have a great day.